Welcome to Bruce Lee's Continued Influence for the 21st Century, a Bruce Lee Foundation discussion. This event is part of Whidbey Reads, an annual community reading event. Whidbey Reads is funded through generous donations from the Clinton, Langley, Freeland, Coopville, and Oak Harbor Friends of the Library groups and is supported by the Snow Isle Libraries Foundation. Our 2022 selection is Interior Chinatown by Charles Yu. Contact your local community library to request a copy. This event is being recorded. The recording will be available on our YouTube channel in a few days. For bonus resources and information about additional Woodby Reads programs, including the author event, visit our website. Your mics are muted. Please use chat to ask questions at any time during the program. Questions will be answered following the formal presentation. We will use chat on our end to share links to relevant resources. Shannon Lee is the CEO and owner of the Bruce Lee Family Companies and chair of the Bruce Lee Foundation as well as the daughter of the legendary martial artist and cultural icon, Bruce Lee. Shannon's mission is to provide access to her father's philosophy in life through education and entertainment and be a cause of healing and unity in the world. She is the creator of Camp Bruce Lee and the One Family Initiative through the Bruce Lee Foundation and has spoken at TED, TEDx, and Creative Mornings to name a few. Shannon lives in California with her daughter, Ren, where she hosts the Bruce Lee podcast and executive produces HBO Max's Warrior, recently renewed for season three. Her first book, Be Water, My Friend, was released in October 2020 and offers insight on how to use her father's philosophies toward a more fluid, peaceful, and fulfilling life. Welcome, Shannon. Thank you. Mike, there we go. Welcome. Thank you for <laughs> Thank joining you. us today. Happy to be here. And I think you wanted to start with um, sharing some photos with us. Sure. Yeah. I just thought it might be nice to set the stage and get everyone get everyone in the in the vibe um, to share some photos of, of my father and and a little bit about the Bruce Lee Foundation. That sounds great. Let's let's get started. Okay. So as you can see, this is a picture of my whole family, my father, my mother, my brother, and myself is the, the little one in arms there. Uh, this was taken in uh, Los Angeles. Um, gosh, this would be probably about 1970, uh, early 1970. Um, and, and we're all wearing our, except for me, I've got a dress on, but we're all wearing our... <laughs> funky 70s garb. Um, next photo. This is my father doing an exercise called Chi Sao, which is um, a Wing Chun exercise, sensitivity exercise. This is in his school. You can see the plaques on the wall in the, in the background. And he is uh, doing this with one of his students, Dan Lee. And as you can see, my father's doing it blindfolded, which you know, to develop when you have very highly developed sensitivity, you can, you can do this exercise blindfolded. Next. This is my father in front of uh, his library. My father was an avid reader and he believed very much in what he called prescriptive reading, reading to uh, aid you in whatever you wanted to know, create, do, learn more about, um, in your life. And he had a massive library. It's over 2,800 books on all matter of subjects. And he read, um, annotated, underlined uh, in uh, many of his books. And here's my father in Washington, in Seattle area, um, meditating on the docks. Um, my father meditated. Uh, frequently, oftentimes like this, sitting very still, but sometimes he also meditated while he was walking or running. 
Um, it was just an opportunity for him to create that space within his mind and his being um, to give him sort of a sense of calm and peace from which he could act. This is me and my dad on the set of Game of Death. Uh, we would go and visit him when he was filming. And back in those days, um, they filmed without sound. So we could, we could go and run around and make noise and uh, be on set. And it was a lot of fun. Here he is on the set of Enter the Dragon um, with John Saxon and Shikien, uh, where he is, you know, giving some discussion, some uh, direction uh, with his co-stars. And here he is at his school in LA with his um, group of students, as you can see, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the very tall in the background. <laughs> and you can see Dan Asanto standing directly on his right and a number of other um, students here as well of note. Um, my father believed in teaching anyone who wanted to learn uh, Chinese Kung Fu and who would just had a sincere desire to learn. And so he taught people from all different backgrounds um, all different, you know, women as well, although obviously there are no women in this uh, photo, but that is how he met my mother. So was in Gong Fu class. This is my father wearing his University of Washington sweatshirt with his father, Hoi Chen. And this is my father with my brother teaching him his punches and kicks as soon as he could move his arms and legs. <laughs> and here is my dad and I again, this is in Los Angeles. This is my father is on the far right and these are his siblings and his mother. So uh, Peter, Agnes, Phoebe, Robert and his mother, Grace. And here he is on the set of Game of Death with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar again. Uh, they were dear, dear friends, as well as um, they got to work together in this particular film. Uh, Kareem was a student of my father's and they had a deep friendship where they would discuss all manner of things, including philosophy. <laughs> and here he is just with a, a sly look in the famous yellow jumpsuit on the set of Game of Death. Stretching and warming up, which he had to do um, very often to be able to do all of the amazing uh, fight choreography that he could um, in Enter the Dragon. And this is just a slide a little bit about um, the Bruce Lee Foundation, which is our nonprofit. And as it says, the Bruce Lee Foundation believes in building bridges that create heartfelt connection and healing support for people, communities, and cultures. And it caps off here with a quote from my father, which is, if everyone would help their neighbor, then no one would be without help. We do a number of different programs, uh, kids camps, Camp Bruce Lee, we do museum exhibits, we have a scholarship uh, endowment at Seattle Central College, and um, we have a one family initiative where we support other organizations and people out in the world doing unifying work. So should I just get into the meat of what we're here to talk yes, about? Yes, <laughs> please do. We're ready, to, we're ready to hear from you. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, thank you everybody for being here. I'm really grateful that you're taking this time. Um, on a, on a Wednesday, or is it on a Wednesday? Yes, what day is it? Um, to, to be with me and to um, have this discussion. The name of the talk is Bruce Lee's Continuing Influence in the 21st Century. And uh, I have some thoughts about what that is that I'm looking forward to sharing with all of you. And um, I think I'll, I'll start just by running through a few uh, ways in which you may already know Bruce Lee and some of his influence. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what I think 
the next wave of his influence is. So I think everyone, for the most part, at least knows the name Bruce Lee, and they associate the name Bruce Lee with Kung Fu, with action films, um, martial arts. Um, but you know, the reason that I got involved in managing, caring for, stewarding my father's legacy is to let people know the full picture of my father beyond sort of this um, siloed, uh, very uh, more narrow martial arts and film um, way that he's known and even beyond the pop culture way in which he's known. Um, there are many things that my father has had a direct influence on and that uh, in, in the world, um, one of which is martial arts. He created his own art called Jeet Kune Do, and he promoted um, the idea of having all around technique as a fighter, uh, many of which say means that he's the precursor to MMA, which as you know, has become a huge sport um, in this day and age. So he had that initial influence to say, you know, we have to release ourselves from style. We have to have the style of no style in order to be a well-rounded martial artist. And we see um, MMA as a direct influence. He's also directly responsible for the rise in martial arts popularity in the Western world. Uh, I think it's uh, very easy to draw a line from the premiere of Enter the Dragon to a huge influx of interest in the martial arts in the West. Um, he also, uh, as we saw in the school photograph that we just looked at, um, taught people of any culture and any background. Um, that was not something that was done uh, in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s. Yes, occasionally there would be a student that was not, a, not Chinese in some of the arts, um, but he had a very welcoming open door policy, something that he was actually taken to task for in his lifetime. But it was an influence where he shared his culture and his love of his art with non-Chinese, with anyone who wanted to learn. And as I said before, it's how he met my mother. He also had a direct influence in action films. Um, he was uh, one of the first, well, I think he was the first to have an independent producer deal with a Hong Kong studio um, following a Hollywood um, model. He also was the first to do a major US Hong Kong co-production, uh, which is something that's continued to happen as time went on. He brought a new flavor and execution to the martial arts for um, the martial arts action used in film, leaning more toward realism rather than magical Kung Fu properties, which is a lot of how the choreography had been done in the East up to that day, up, up to his day. But then he brought more of a realism and a lot of how he approached fight choreography is still seen today. I mean, now every, every superhero, every uh, spy, is a martial artist essentially in how they fight. And that's a direct influence from my father. Sometimes they even uh, you know, copy him a little bit, his mannerisms. Um, they do little homages to him in films. And if you're a big fan, you probably can spot those. Um, physical fitness. He was a huge model of phys for physical fitness and health and bringing cross training and nutritional regimens to the martial arts and um, and, and, and believing very much in cross-disciplinary training and experimentation and, and training the body for function rather than just form. Huge pioneer of that, something that is still happening today in athletic pursuits all around the world. He was a huge influence for Asian representation in Hollywood. He had a, a, a policy to turn down roles that were stereotypical or demeaning to Asian men in, um, in his pursuits in Hollywood, which meant that there weren't a whole lot of roles for him. He also made up his mind that he was going to put maximum effort into making sure that some 
a portrayal of an authentic Asian man would be made in Hollywood. And that was his goal and what he set out to do. And as we know, through making of Enter the Dragon, he did accomplish that eventually. And that helped in a lot of ways on a global level to change the perception of Asian men, particularly in the West. It generated a rejuvenation of spirit um, and a further sense of pride for Asians in particular, as I say, throughout the Western world. And he, in, in light of his action films and the way he dominated on screen, the type of storytelling and action sequences that he created, he also became a hero to um, communities of color all around the world. Um, he spoke to the idea of human equality and unity and the importance of the individual over the organization in his storytelling. And um, that resonated widely with people all around the world. And he's held up uh, nowadays as sort of a, a bridge, a person who is a bridge between cultures. Um, so these are all things that you may already know, um, especially if you've seen any of the documentaries or read any of the books. Um, these are some of his influences, influences that we are still very much feeling the echoes of today um, here in the 21st century. Um, I mean, really, we're just getting started into the meat of the conversation around representation and equality, uh, not just in Hollywood, but in life. Um, that said, when it comes to my father's love of martial arts, he has even been occasionally now at this point in time taken to task for creating a stereotype, a stereotype that all Asians know Kung Fu. And one that, that a lot of uh, people don't like to be saddled with. But I do wanna remind everyone that it is society that per perpetuates this stereotype and that what my father did with his life stemmed from a very deep place of passion and love, truly, of who he was, what he loved to do. Love is often not a word used uh, in conjunction with Bruce Lee, but it is very much an accurate uh, term because what he did, he did from his heart and from his soul. And he dedicated uh, all of his effort and energy toward the cultivation of his own spirit and the sharing of that out into the world. And to me, that's about love. Um, so how did he do all of this? Some of it obviously will remain a bit of a mystery as we can't get inside his own head and we can't ask him and know what his motivations and feelings and, and what stars had to align for all of this to happen in order for him to accomplish this. But the good news is that this is a mystery that we all have the ability to unravel, but for ourselves. So while we may not be able to say exactly what all the motivations uh, and thoughts for Bruce Lee were, we know some of them from his writings and his practices and teachings and what he was able to accomplish. But what his legacy speaks to is what he, what, which was, uh, what his legacy speaks to is his main, uh, his, his main idea which is self-actualization, to make a reality of oneself. And so to me, when people ask me, you know, what is my father's legacy all about? One answer that I like to give is possibility. It's about what's possible. You know, um, if we really do the work to cultivate ourselves, to share ourselves out into the world, to express ourselves honestly from the root of who we are. And I think it's that possibility that excites us about Bruce Lee. When we see him on screen, we are engaged and excited because we are witnessing uh, someone's great potential that they cultivated and did something extraordinary with. And I think that's what we sense when we sense that 
in other people as well. Um, so just what is the remaining underrepresented, in my opinion, influence that Bruce Lee has for us as we move forward into the 21st century that perhaps you're not as aware of and that made everything that I've just spoken about possible. Uh, that's what I'd like to focus on next. And so we will have a question and answer segment um, at the uh, end of my little talk here. And I'm happy to answer any questions on anything that I've already said or anything that I haven't yet said. Um, but before I do that, I wanna take a moment to just sort of set the stage for what I think my father's continuing influence is. So, empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. You put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a teapot, it becomes the teapot. You put it into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friends. So with that in mind, I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about my story rather than my father's story. Because Bruce Lee's continuing influence is happening through me. As the steward of his legacy, yes, but also simply as his daughter and communicator of many of his ideas and practices. I lost my father when I was four years old. And the question I am asked most by everyone, so I will answer it now is, what do you remember about your father? And the truth of the matter is, I don't have many really steadfast memories. I can't tell you a story he told me. I can't tell you some wisdom or some uh, event that happened. My memories of him are like glimpses. Uh, I remember going to visit him at the studio when he would film. I remember being with him at the house in our house in Hong Kong, but they're just these sort of faded glimpses of, of memory. But there is one way in which I remember him very, very keenly, directly, and um, in a way that has affected me my whole life. And that is that I remember the feeling of him. I remember his energy. I remember the feeling of his love, his attention, what it was to have it be focused on me. And for many years, it took me a long time to understand that that was a memory. I used to think that I was a little bit, um, maybe, uh, you know, uh, delusional because I would really feel like, gosh, I feel like I know this person. I know this person in a really essential way, but how could I? I only knew him for four years and I was a child. But the truth of the matter is that as a child, we are just as perceptive in some ways, maybe even more so because we are perceiving with our senses not just our thoughts. And so I can say, in fact, I feel I know his soul. I know his, the vital part of him, that energetic part. And it has held me all these many years. Um, Cut to right before my 24th birthday, my brother was killed in a horrible accident. And I was plummeted into uh, the depths of 
despair and depression for several years after that. I was in a lot of internal pain. You know, I got to, I did grieve obviously um, in that year or so immediately after, but then you sort of don't know what to do with all this pain, but you have to keep living. So you're going through the paces of life, but you're just in so much pain all the time on the inside. And, and you don't really know what to do. And you feel this sense of like, well, I'm going through life, but I'm not really living. And I got to a place where I just, I really didn't know what to do. And I just had this subtle mantra in my mind, like, please help me someone somehow, please help me not be in this amount of pain. And what happened was I was delivered this huge stack of my father's writings because there were books that were gonna be published. And as part of that, they had made copies of all of his writings. And just as a courtesy, I was you know, not involved at that time in stewarding his legacy. I was just given a copy of all the stacks of his writings. And I started to go through them and I saw a bunch of the quotes that I already knew, like the be water quote, and I knew you know, using no way is way, having no limitations, a lot of these quotes. And suddenly I came across this one quote that just hit me right square in the chest. And it was, the medicine for my suffering I had within me from the very beginning, but I did not take it. My ailment came from within myself, but I did not observe it until this moment. And now I see I will never find the light unless, like the candle, I am my own fuel. I think it was probably the word suffering that grabbed my attention because I was definitely suffering. But that quote somehow said to me, you know, it didn't give me the answer, but it said, you have the medicine for your suffering within you. You just have to find it. And so from that, I began a long, lifelong practice that continues today of seeking, seeking my own cure for what ailed me reading books, going to therapy, uh, working with uh, spiritual advisors, uh, all different manner of things that seemed natural and right for me to do. And that led me from one thing to another thing to another thing. And when I finally uh, came out of this deep, deep pain that I had been in for several years, I realized one, a couple things. I realized that I had actually never been as happy and content as I had become in my whole life. I had been carrying around um, a very subtle but pervasive depression, assumedly since the age of about four. And that had been a part of me. And I just thought, hey, this is how everybody feels. And I think we all feel that way to some extent. Like if I feel this way, then you know, other people must feel this way. And um, I just thought it was normal. But it wasn't until suddenly this weight was lifted off of my shoulders and I became more joyful and more alive that I realized that um, actually that's not normal. <laughs> What we want to seek as normal is a sense of uh, joy, inner joy, and a sense of inner peace. And my father's words had led me there. And so when my mom came to me and said, you know, I'm thinking about stepping back from looking after your father's things. Do you, would you have any interest in that? You don't have to do that. You should do whatever you want but just let me know, is this of interest? 
I said, absolutely, it is of interest because my mission has become to let people know this, to let people know this part of my father's life, which is why I wrote the book, Be Water, My Friend, The Teachings of Bruce Lee, which is to share with people that my father is, in fact, martial artist, action film star, and a philosopher, but really a philosopher. Like if you, if you read my, uh, my book, you come to find like, it wasn't just like a handful of quotes on a paper napkin, you know, like there was some deep study and deep practice and deep thought that laid the foundation for everything that he was able to do in his life. I, and so, you know, I went on to create this business. I started a podcast at some point called the Bruce Lee podcast. You can still listen to it today that broke down a lot of his philosophies and how to use them in your own life and spoke to guests about how they approach their lives as well and their personal philosophies. And then I wrote the book. Um, you know, I always knew my father had a focus on philosophy as part of his study of martial arts but he was truly um, a philosopher. And this is what I wanted to impart. Philosopher, however, can be such a passive term. It feels very intellectual. Um, so I would perhaps rather say that my father had a spiritual practice, not a religious practice, a spiritual practice. He probably wouldn't have used those words, but had he lived um, till today, I think I rather believe he would see it that way. So what is a spiritual practice? I think of the word spirit as synonymous with the word life. So he had a life practice, a highly customized artisanal life practice. My father said, I am a martial artist by choice. I am an actor by profession, but what I really aim to be is an artist of life. Wanting to be an artist of life means having a practice, having a practice to infuse your whole life with your essence, your spirit. It means desiring to cultivate and use your energy in the fullest, most fulfilling way toward the creation of your particular life. So yes, when you watch him on screen, you become fully engaged, you're mesmerized perhaps by all the Kung Fu prowess, but there's something else that is transfixing you in that moment. And I think it's because you are witnessing the harnessing of human potential at a very high level. You are seeing the cultivation of possibility for a human being. So how did he take hold of his potential and create a reality of it? This is his practice he called self-actualization, making a reality of one's self. And this is what in, underpins and is the foundation for all that he was able to do. And this is the next part of his legacy that in my opinion is the next wave of what we need to bring into our consciousness now more than ever. But he also had a warning about philosophy. My father had a quote that said, philosophy is itself the disease for which it pretends to be the cure. So what does that mean? It means that philosophy without practice, without implementation, without action is just talk. So I want you to take these next ideas that I wanna share with you, not just as ideas, but as possible applications, as practices. So to start us off with those things that I want to share uh, with you about how he approached life in terms of self-actualization, 
I will lead off with another quote because I think it's a great sort of prescription for how he approached things and how we can approach things. He said, research your own experience, absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, and add what is essentially your own. My father really believed that the function and duty of a quality human being is the sincere and honest development of one's potential, which is self-actualization. And this was his practice that he brought to everything that he did. It's an important thing to know that as hard as my father trained his body, which you can see, he worked hard at training his body. He also trained his mind. And why is this so important to know? Because it all sort of starts and ends in the mind, right? Even if you're having a physical experience, a somatic experience in your body that is overwhelming and brought on by, you know, uh, trauma, in order to help that, to effectuate that, there is an awareness in the mind that has to take place. And there has to be the mind's willingness to seek its cure. And so I really want to talk about some different ideas and practices that you can consider that are really about a perspective shift. My father said, not conviction, not method, but perception is the way of truth. A state of awareness, effortless awareness, pliable awareness, choiceless awareness. This is what we're working toward. So how can we make small percep perception shifts that can blossom into practices that can help us find the medicine for our particular suffering. Let's start with simplicity. How do we practice having simplicity of mind? My father said, a simple mind is one that functions, that thinks and feels without a motive. I'm gonna let these sink in a little. <laughs> no hidden agenda, no agenda, hidden or otherwise. It just functions, thinks, feels, and perceives with what is happening right now in this moment. That is a simplicity of mind. He said, simplicity is an inward state of being in which there is no contradiction, no comparison. It is the quality of perception in approaching any problem. I love that. I love that because we make such a complexity out of everything with our judgments, with our assumptions, with the stories that we weave, the stories that help us but also hinder us. So simplicity is a quality of perception in approaching any problem. Approach that problem simply. Drop all of the assumptions, the stories, the judgments, what he would call emptying your cup. So the quote I started with, started with empty your mind. This is simplicity of mind. And this is one influence that I think is important for us to take forward that my father can share. The next is totality. My father said an organism works as a whole 
We are not a summation of parts, but a very subtle coordination of all these bits that go into making the organism. What is an organism? An organism is an ecosystem. So I'm an organism within my own body, but then so is my family an organism because it's an ecosystem. An organism is an ecosystem that works together to sustain life. So my family is an ecosystem, my community, my city, my country, and ultimately my planet. So we are not just a bunch of parts. We are actually a coordination of parts. And what my father went on to say is there's no such thing as an effective segment of a totality. Because if only one segment of a totality is effective and all the rest of it is not, then the totality is not effective. I think this is a very important perceptive perception shift, perspective shift that we need to consider, especially in this moment in this world. So what is the practice for totality? My father said, emphasis should fall not on the cultivation of a particular department, which then merges into the totality, but rather emphasis should fall on the totality that then enters and unites all the parts. So one way of looking at it, instead of saying, I will be happy, peaceful, and healthy when this thing happens, you can say, I will work to be happy, peaceful, and healthy, and then I will bring that happiness, that peacefulness, that health to all the things, to my work, to my relationships, to my home to my life. And lastly, he said not to localize or partialize, or as we like to call it, compartmentalize. To not do those things is the culmination of spiritual training. So see, he did use the word spiritual. <laughs> Another important influence that I think he can have and that we need to carry forward into the 21st century are some thoughts about stillness. Stillness, which I will also use as a synonym for peace. So one thing that came clear to me in the recent years is that all possibility, and we've been talking about my father as possibility, all possibility actually springs from peace. Because when you are still at your core, when you have space there, when you have repose, you are free to move in any direction. So peace starts with the self not the outer circumstance. And you become a possibility for greater, greater circumstantial peace outside of you when you are peace, when you have peace. He said, who is there that can make muddy water clear? But if allowed to remain still, it becomes clear of itself. He said, we are vortices whose center is a point that is motionless and eternal, but which appears in manifestation as motion. So hold to the core. 
So this term we use and hear a lot like being grounded, right? Um, having a still solid, grounded, open, free, peaceful foundation or core allows you to manifest in so many different directions. It is actually the root of personal power. He said the stillness in stillness is not the real stillness. Only when there is stillness in movement does the universal rhythm manifest. So this is a perspective shift to consider how do you gain that central stillness within yourself so that you can be free to move, to create what work needs to happen there so that you can step into your greatest potential. My father said this achieving the center, being grounded in oneself is about the highest state a human being can achieve. I would, the next thing I would like to share is about emptiness. So how do we achieve that space and how do we manifest from that space? So I'm gonna read from my book <laughs> um, about how we do this. It is something that he called the living void. He said, the living void is a realm of heightened and effortless awareness, and it is very much alive. You are the active perceiver and feeler here, and you perceive without obstruction. My father had many names for the void, emptiness, nothingness, the formless form. Another name used for this aspect of the living void is no-mindedness. My father said, no mindedness is not being without emotion or feeling, but being one in whom feeling is not sticky or blocked. To have a mind that is not grasping onto things. We are aware of our thoughts and feelings, but we do not get stuck in our thoughts and feelings in a feedback loop. We're not distracted, overwhelmed, confused. One can never be the master of his technical knowledge unless all his psychic hindrances are removed and he can keep the mind in the state of fluidity, ever purged of whatever technique he has obtained with non-conscious effort. When my father talks about psychic hindrances, he is talking about anything that blocks your flow and your immediate expression. We want to remove these hindrances so we can move away from reaction and into skillful response. The place of emptiness is, in truth, the birthplace of reality because it is from the nothing that we manifest something. It is the moment, however small, in which a choice is made. In this tiny empty gap lies the moment of decision, of action, of reflex, of thought. This empty gap is the place where consciousness and unconsciousness meet. For sometimes we make a conscious choice in that gap, and sometimes we react unconsciously, spurred on by our subconscious conditioning and our training. But the more we practice choosing quickly, and the more we practice conditioning our subconscious or unconscious, the smaller this empty gap becomes, and we can learn to act from a place of cultivated instinct. So imagine, if you will, 
that you could be in total concert with this tiny empty gap. No matter how small it is, you could consciously choose your response with ease and confidence, or you could condition your subconscious mind with so much nutritious, positive practice that when you responded unconsciously, the response was still a perfect expression made with ease and confidence. What if this gap could become so tiny that it seemed to disappear altogether? That seamlessness is the feeling of true flow, where we are moving within the oneness. As Bruce Lee reminds us, all movements come out of emptiness. The mind is the name given to this dynamic aspect of emptiness and emptiness is sincerity. So there is no crookedness, no ego-centered motivation, only genuineness and straightforwardness, which allows nothing between itself and its movements. So these are some of the thoughts, the practices, the perspectives that I wanted to share. Some of the mental training that my father undertook, because I think this is the next wave of his influence into the 21st century and hopefully beyond. It may feel like a lot, but truly he said to free yourself, simply observe closely what you normally do. Do not condemn or approve it, merely observe. It is perception alone that will resolve all of our problems. He said, when man comes to a vital realization of those great spiritual forces within himself and begins to use those forces in all areas of his life, his progress in the future will be unparalleled. And lastly, I wanted to share another favorite quote of mine. And as I was preparing for this talk, it suddenly struck me what this quote is. So I will uh, share it with you first. And that is the integrating principle of the whole, the spirit of the universe is instinct, with contrivance, which flows with purpose. Our instinct, our natural instinct, with contrivance, which is skill, our skill in creating, which flows with purpose. And I thought, isn't that a great definition? of love. So my friends, empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. You put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a teapot, it becomes the teapot. You put it into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friends. Thank you for listening. And now we'll open up to some questions. Thank you so much, Shannon. That was awesome. We do have some great questions. Um, let me just begin by saying that um, you should presume that uh, my voice is the voice of the questioner or the commenter. Yep. 
So uh, what is one story that has always stood out to you about how Bruce Lee or the foundation inspired someone? Oh, gosh. I have to say, um, I am blessed to be the receiver of so many stories of people who have changed their lives, who have overcome major obstacles, who have um, been able to take hold of these perspective shifts for themselves and create um, a better situation for themselves in their lives. I mean, I've talked to people who have changed their careers. I've talked to people who have dealt with um, life-threatening illness. Um, I, know, I know one particular um, man who was diagnosed with, and I'm not gonna remember it right now, but a very debilitating, uncur incurable disease. And he decided to um, take on his own healing. He started practicing Qigong and trying to like create more energy flow. He was a huge Bruce Lee fan and aficionado. And he decided to walk across the entire country and end up in Seattle at my father's grave as a show of what, he, of the healing that he had been able to obtain for himself. And I think people who have this condition um, often die at a very young age. And he has been living now for many, many, many years. He's, I think, older than I am. <laughs> um, and that's just one, you know, amazing and miraculous story of someone who just harnessed their own potential based on the inspiration and motivation that they got from my father. That's great. Um, next question. Um, do you have a favorite Bruce Lee film? Um, that's a hard one. You know, it kind of pings back and forth depending on where I am in my life. So for many years when I was younger, I would always say Enter the Dragon was my favorite Bruce Lee film. And uh, that was mostly because I had the most memory of it and because it's the one in which my father is speaking in his own voice. And so I get to hear his voice and, um, and it's a fun, great movie as well. There's lots of great tidbits of philosophy in there too. I know my mom's favorite movie, it uh, has always been Way of the Dragon because my father wrote it, directed it, produced it, starred in it, did all the fight choreography. And to her, you really get to see a sense of humor in that film. You really get to see the closest version of who he, of how he was in his actual life. I have to say, during the pandemic, I recently rewatched um, *Fist of Fury* or, or um, *Chinese Connection*, as it's also called. That's also a great movie. I mean, I don't know. It just like depending on what's going on in the world, depending on what's going on in my own life, I kind of feel like. Um, the movies speak to me at different times. Next question. Um, what struck people or fans the most upon meeting your dad in person, do you think? I think people found my dad extremely engaging. Um, he had this ability, and I sort of alluded to it when I was talking about what I remember most about him. Um, he had this amazing ability to focus his full attention on you. And, and that is something that is um, not seen that often. You know, a lot of times we're just very casual and we're kind of thinking thoughts and we're not 100% tuned in. But when someone is like 100% tuned in to you, and like really engaging you and like really looking in the eye, um, that is actually a, quite an amazing experience. And so I think people found him, his energy to be extremely um, um, engaging and influencing. Like they were excited when they were with him in part because he was excited. 
So I think upon meeting him, that was a lot of what people felt. So you talk in your book um, about a time when your dad was asked about how he felt when Asian roles were given to white actors. Um, can you tell us a little bit about his response? I mean, I think he just thought it was ridiculous. <laughs> I, I think he just thought, um, and, and, which is why I said, and he, and he said in, a, in an interview that he sat for in 1971 with a Canadian talk show host, Pierre Burton, he said, I've already made up my mind that something of an authentic portrayal of an Asian is going to be seen in Hollywood. And he put maximum effort into trying to get those roles, which he did not have much success in. I mean, he was supposed to star in what became Kung Fu, the TV series in the 70s, who they cast David Carradine for, who is a white man to play a Chinese man. And he just said, you know, whatever's happening is happening, but I am not losing my focus. I am continuing to create this. So I'm not going to complain too much about what's happening out here. I'm just gonna do the thing that's gonna be different. I'm just gonna be the one to make the mark. And, um, and that's exactly what he did. And he was undeterred, you know, he, he ultimately had to leave Hollywood and go to Hong Kong in order to do that because he could not get the roles and he could not get his projects made in Hollywood. No one would listen to him. And so I think he found it um, ridiculous, but also insulting and just so born out of fear and just so born out of ignorance. And he wanted to make sure that he had a hand in trying to change that. I think he was pretty successful in that endeavor. Yes. Um, <laughs> so Natalie says, thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, for someone who's new to the work of Bruce Lee, do you have any suggestions or advice for where to start to learn and practice some of his philosophy? I mean, I'm just going to comment now uh, outside of my role as uh, reading these questions to you and say, you know, read, be water, my friend. There's a <laughs> lot in there. So book plug. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the blog. Um, I would say that my book, um, there are many books, you know, there are many books that are just of my father's writings. You know, there's the Tao of Jeet Kune Do, which is more directly focused on martial arts, but is also has a lot of his philosophy in it as well. There's a book called Artist of Life. There's all sorts of books, but I would say that my book one of the things that my books, book does is that it tries to make it, um, first of all, to translate these philosophies into um, more layman's terms, more current terminology, and also to give you ideas of how to practice it. You can also listen to the Bruce Lee podcast. I would say that is also an excellent place to start. Uh, there's, I don't know, there's a couple, there's, you know, close to 200 episodes of the Bruce Lee podcast. So, um, so there's a lot in there that you can, that you can do as well. And you can look at what the different names of the episodes are and the themes. Um, I am in the process of creating um, writing prompts, meditations, and um, further practice tools based on my book that I will be releasing in the, sometime this summer. So you can check back for that. Um, and, um, but I would say that my book is probably the one text that does attempt to um, make my father's philosophies most approachable for anyone. You don't have to be a martial artist. You don't have to be a Bruce Lee fan. You just have to be a human being um, and, and give you some cues as to how to use them. 
So Abby says she moved to Seattle from the UK. Um, uh, she's of South Asian descent. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, and I, I, I might be misreading this. Um, I'm just going to read it, in, it, it as written. My wife is American and I have a son and daughter who are three years apart. I have been a fan from childhood and talk about your father all the time. How did you manage your depression without your father during childhood and um, as a teenager? I think what I would say is I didn't manage my depression in my childhood and as a teenager. Um, it was definitely there, um, but I didn't have the awareness to know what it was at that time. Um, you know, the 70s and early 80s was... Um, there wasn't as much sort of awareness around mental health and around um, all that, um, you know, spiritual practice, that kind of things. So it wasn't as much the jargon of the day. Um, and so I would say I wasn't that aware of it. I just knew that um, I often had a lot of just heaviness and despair. Um, I lacked a certain amount of, you know, energy, depression and anxiety, which by the way, are two sides of the same coin. Um, they drain your energy. So what I would say is if you're having trouble as a human being, having energy to sort of show up in your life, then that's something worth looking at. You know, you don't have to put a label on it after whatever, but like, if there's just something that feels heavy, that's weighing you down, or that's causing angst or anxiety within, um, whether that's for yourself or for your children or for your friends or whatever it is, I would say it's something worth uh, being having curiosity about and seeing if there's a way for you to shift that. This um, person says, thank you for sharing. I found your book very encouraging. Uh, what's your favorite aspect of working um, and directing the Bruce Lee Foundation? I would have to say this is one of my favorite aspects, like just getting to share the part of it that really speaks to me because, um, you know, I didn't get involved so much in running uh, and stewarding my father's legacy in order to run business, you know, like I wasn't a business person. I have a degree in music. <laughs> so I see myself as more of a creative, as more of a creator and a creative person. So getting to write this book, getting to share the parts that like really excite me and that I think we can all learn from and use. And what I say is this next wave of Bruce Lee into the 21st century. I really believe that it is, especially given how polarized the world is right now we need deep healing and that all starts with a shift in a perspective about what we view as life and what we view as our role in life and connecting with one another and coming into shared experience and community I think is so important and so this is one of the one of the parts I really love the most um and I hope that came across as I was speaking <laughs> I also like to to do the creating so you know getting to create programs getting to create film and tv projects uh getting to write more all of that I I, I love how does your voice or expression and the message of your book differentiate from your father's and and how can others get, how can ha, people like me, how can we get involved with the Bruce Lee Foundation? Thank you for asking. Um, to get involved with the Bruce Lee Foundation, you know, please visit our website, brucelyfoundation.org. Please follow Bruce Lee Foundation on social media. Um, it's at Bruce Lee Foundation on Instagram, Facebook. Um, we are, as an organization, actually in the midst of a transformation. We, um, we have a number of programs that we do. We have kids camps called Camp Bruce Lee, where I've created a program, a mind, body, spirit program to deliver to kids. Uh, right now, we work mostly with kids like 
five or six up to about 10 or 11, but we're expanding our programming to junior high and high school soon. Um, so that we can give kids some of these tools, some of these mind, body, spirit practices, some tools of introspection and knowing themselves so that they can figure out like what is the expression of self they wanna have in the world and what's meaningful to them. And also then having co the confidence um, to, to an inner strength um, in their own being, right? So um, that's part of what the Bruce Lee Foundation does. We also do a number of museum exhibits. We're opening a new exhibit at the Wing Luke Museum in this summer. Uh, we're opening a new exhibit at the Chinese Historical Society of San, in San Francisco in April. Uh, we've just opened a new exhibit with the Hong Kong Heritage Museum. We also have um, in November, and we also have a small display up in the Academy Museum in Los Angeles. This is all part of sharing the stories and sharing the full picture of Bruce Lee, the human being. And so going to see any of these exhibits, uh, if you can, um, is another way to engage with his legacy and his teachings. Um, and then, um, and, and so of course, you know, we, uh, in terms of the foundation, like I said, we're in a moment of transformation where we are about to we're spending this year to sort of um, figuring out how we can have even deeper impact, how we can reach even more people. Um, and in 2023, which will be the 50th anniversary of my father's legacy, uh, we look to we are looking to expand our reach and our programming on a much larger scale. So I don't know, there was a first part to that question beyond the foundation. I don't know if I hit it or not, but. <laughs> well, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, who, if anyone, do you feel represents the true essence of martial arts in movies and media today? Um, if anyone can, um, uh, in comparison to the incomparable Bruce Lee. Yes. Well, here I'm gonna have to do a shameless plug of my show Warrior, <laughs> which is on HBO Max. Seasons one and two are there. Get binging. I will say it is not appropriate for small children, so do not watch it with small children. But that show has the essence and energy of Bruce Lee. And there are, we have this beautiful cast um, and beautiful Asian cast who get to play these complex comp and wonderful vital characters, characters that my father would have loved to have been able to play. The show is based on an idea that he created for himself to play. So unfortunately he's not able to, but many of the people on the show are portraying a facet of him and his energy um, on our show Warrior. So. HBO Max season three will be coming. We start shooting season three uh, this summer. So that's uh, very exciting. And beyond that, I mean, look, here's what I would say. I would say that um, it's hard to say exactly who, like, oh, this person or this. I think there are many people. I think anyone expressing themselves, especially very dedicatedly toward martial arts in film, not just action in film, but martial arts in film. Um, they are all such a huge, have such a huge skill level and expression of themselves. And their expression is their expression, which is the whole point of self-actualization. It's not to be Bruce Lee, it's to be the expression of yourself. I will say I'm really looking forward to seeing Michelle Yeoh's next film that's coming out. I can't remember what it's called, but it looks phenomenal. And I think she is a beautiful expression in movement. So um, someone would like to hear your thoughts on how you or your dad kept up the daily grind. Um, mm. They say they find it a big jump from reading goals uh, and keeping up the routine, whether it's physical exercise or intellectual preparation for career changes, all of those things. How do you, do you and did your dad manage 
the daily grind? Um, first of all, I just want to say to that person, you are not alone. We all struggle with that. I struggle with it every day. <laughs> it is part of being human. So I think you need to always take the pressure off. You know, you need to rest when you need to rest. You need to, um, my father always said, you need to, you need to move forward at the staying speed. So the staying speed is the one where, you know, you're not going to run out of energy. So you can't just be like going, 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 going so fast um, because you will run out of energy. You will be like, this is too hard. I can't do it. And then you'll crash. Then you'll have these wide swings between activity and non-activity. And then you'll have to like muster back up the strength to get active again. So I think there are a number of things that are really important. Um, sleep and rest are hugely important. My father was a big believer in sleep and rest. And so am I. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> um, and you just have to recognize that like sometimes when you're taking that, you know, laying on the couch and binge watching a few hours of, of TV, you may actually need that. You may actually need that time. I also think that meditation is huge. And meditation, I think people kind of like roll their eyes about meditation because they find it really hard because they think that meditation has to mean like sitting in a rigid posture like a monk and, you know, you know, not having any thoughts and all of this, which is really hard to do. But I think meditation, as I said, my father sometimes meditated in movement. He would walk around the yard or he would go for a run. And it was a time for him to just like create mental space. So instead of directing your mind all the time, if you can just like loosen your grip and just allow your mind even to just daydream or to just observe your thoughts as they flow through, like it doesn't have to be about this rigid, you know, empty minded, um, thing it can get there eventually if you want it to but the place to start is to just allow yourself the mental space to close your eyes and just rest for a minute just let it be loose maybe feel into your body and feel space Feel everything that's happening, the sensations, the movements, listen to the sounds that are all around you. It doesn't have to be too rigid. But I think that that type of meditation gives you a type of mental rest that gives you the fortitude for when you then need to put the car back and drive and hit the gas. So this next uh, comment and question seems to play right into that. Um, simplicity of mind, empty your mind, no way as a way. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that these thoughts were handed down from your dad's teachers and instructors or through his self-discipline and meditation? I think it was a combination of things. So I, I, I mentioned and I showed the picture of my father in front of his library. So my father was an avid reader and a prescriptive reader, as I said, reading for the things he wanted to know more about. Um, one of his, a couple of his favorite philosophers were Krishnamurti and Alan Watts, um, both of whom had deep, deep practices around you know, emptying the cup, choiceless awareness. Some of these words like, my father wrote about choiceless awareness. That particular phrase used often is actually Krishnamurti's phrase. His uh, Wing Chun instructor in Hong Kong, um, Yip Man, was um, another wisdom keeper for him through the lens of martial arts. And what my father said is that everything he learned about life, he learned through the practice of martial arts. 
because the, the ability to expand those lessons into a broader sense, which is one of the things I'm trying to do in my book is like, okay, he may have, we're talking about martial arts here, but let's expand that to substitute the word martial arts with the word life, you know? And, you know, his, his um, Wing Chun instructor, Yip Man, was, you know, from a very Taoist, and my father read the Tao Te Ching, you know, Lao Tzu, all those things as well. I had a very Taoist perspective and was often telling him stories about, you know, like, oh, the oak tree is very strong, but it's also very rigid. And in a storm, it can be knocked down, whereas a bamboo can bend with the wind, you know, all these sorts of parables. And he actually came up with his ideas around being like water when he was 17 years old because he had been banished from his martial arts class for having too much yang as opposed to yin being too aggressive trying to enforce his strategy all the time rather than moving with his opponent and being with like what was actually showing up and happening in the moment rather than like no i'm going to do this i'm going to do this i'm going to do this and his teacher, Yip Man, said, enough, go home. You can't train for a week. Think about what I'm trying to tell you. And so he did, and he was very frustrated because for him, he loved that outlet. And um, so one day he actually got a, a boat and he was bobbing in the waves and the water and he was running through his mind. And we know this because he wrote about it. And he was going through in his mind, like, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? What does he mean? And what does gentleness have to do with martial arts? Like, I'm just supposed to try to win, you know? And he got super frustrated and he punched the water. And in that moment, he had an epiphany. And he was like, and he said, oh, when I punched the water, the water moved out of the way of my hand. And then he tried to grab the water and the water ran through his fingers. And he was like, oh, <laughs> this is what it is to be fluid. This is what it is to have gentleness in martial arts. Like, I don't need to always just pound, pound, pound my opponent. I can move out of the way. I can be in concert with him. Um, you know, he can try to grasp me and I can just run through his fingers, right? And so it's part him because the thing is, you can read all the books in the world, but if you can't get it, like in a deep knowing experiential way, then it's not truly yours yet. It's just an idea until you can start implementing it. And so I think he got it from all the places around him, teachers, books, but it also came from him. So um, what practices or life events have been most productive for you in your own self-actualization journey? Um, so many things. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things that has been most helpful to me is to to have a deep desire. And this desire is a desire that more and more, you know, when we're young, we recognize the deep desires that we have mostly as the ways in which we beat ourselves up. You should be doing this. You should be thinner. You should be more productive. You should be doing your homework. You should be should, 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 should. And that makes us feel bad, right? But there's, a, but there's a great clue in there of what we want, right? What do we want? We want all these things we're kind of beating ourselves up about. So the great practice is to continue to hold in your heart a desire to feel better 
to feel more alive, to have more energy, to do all those things, but with great compassion. Great compassion for yourself, knowing that your heart is sincere. Everyone's heart is always sincere. It's just sometimes the methods that we use to enact that sincerity are what we need to question. <laughs> we don't want to just act on impulse. We want to actually look within and say, what is the deep sincerity of my heart? What do I really wish that I had? Now, how can I stop taking it out on the world for not just giving it to me, but actually how can I attain the amount of peace required and this is where I was talking about peace and stillness, that groundedness is so important because you have to have a certain amount of repose in order to have intention. And so it's like, how can I forgive myself for not being perfect, understand that the circumstances of my life, whatever they may be, are here for me to use toward my betterment and learn from, and then how do I start taking the steps forward? So I want to um, say that uh, we are running um, to the end of the program. And um, I just want to say we might not get to all the questions. So I'm sorry about that. Um, Shannon, if there's a way for um, attendees to reach out to you um, mm -hmm. and ask our questions to you directly. That would be great if you want to share that in chat and we can share it out uh, to our attendees. Um, meanwhile, the next question is, uh, does the Bruce Lee Foundation work with therapists or life coaches for its participants? And would they be interested in partnering or working with therapists and coaches if not already doing that? Yeah, so um, we are not already doing that. That said, um, as I said, we are looking to sort of reimagine um, our impact and we really want to have a focus on these mind, body, spirit tools and how to put them into people's hands. Um, and so we will be looking to expand um, our network and our of collaborators and how we can move these things forward. And so um, I would just say anyone who has um, something they'd like to share or a service that they provide or who wants to sign up to be on a, a list of volunteers or collaborators down the line um, can email info at brucelyfoundation.org and we will hold on to that and as we are, because we're in, in that process now of program creation. So as we come out of that process, then we will know who we can reach out to. In terms of asking their questions of me, um, uh, you can follow me on social media. I'm gonna say that with a caveat as that I'm not like the most amazing social media person <laughs> in terms of response and all of that, but it is something that I'm working toward being a little bit better at. Um, one of my practices, just in terms of having an authentic point of connection, my, I'm only on Instagram, me personally, at the real Shannon Lee, um, but you can also reach through the Bruce Lee accounts and the Bruce Lee Foundation accounts with your questions and um, there's, as I said, info at brucelyfoundation.org. There's also info at brucelee.com. So there are a number of different pathways and avenues. Um, and all I can say is we will do our best to, uh, to get back to people. That sounds great. Um, uh, well, I certainly thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. Um, uh, I think yeah. that will close us out today. Do you have anything else that you'd like to add before we do that, Shannon? Well, I just want to express my gratitude to, uh, to all of you for reaching out to me, for hosting this amazing uh, 
space and time for us to connect and share. Um, I want to encourage everyone to read Interior Chinatown. Um, I want to encourage everyone to support Whidbey Reads and Snow Isle Libraries and, um, and of course the Bruce Lee Foundation. And um, I just want to say thank you for this time together this morning. Mutual really Admiration Society. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much for um, supporting our work. And believe me, uh, we were thrilled um, that you were uh, able to come and present a program for us. Thank you oh. so much, Shannon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.